Hello and welcome to another production of Manna from Heaven Ministries and Remnant of Truth International. Just so happens this afternoon that our brother from Remnant of Truth is not here with us, Pastor John Flores, but we do have our faithful co-partner, and that's Miss Brittany Scott. Brittany, so great to have you in the studio with us this afternoon. Exciting times we're living in. Yes, it is. Thank you. It's always enjoyable to come and do shows like this with you. This is one of our favorite times of the year at Manna from Heaven Ministries, and the reason for that is because this particular season is also known as the season of our joy, and it's the fall festivals on the Hebrew calendar. A lot of our listeners that might not be familiar with the Leviticus chapter 23 and the, the holy convocations or the holy mikra that you see outlined in Leviticus chapter 23, and uh, there's a number of other places. You can see it in Exodus as well, some other places where those holy convocations are mentioned. But there's quite a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. that I believe is out there regarding these holy convocations. And we know that our Messiah, Yeshua, you may call him Jesus, uh, if you are not familiar with his Hebrew name, uh, he fulfilled the spring festivals to a very minute degree. Those mm -hmm. spring fe festivals being Passover, uh, you probably be familiar with the term Easter, but let me just make it very clear. That there's a, quite a bit of difference between Easter and Passover. Yes. Passover, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and uh, the early first fruits, mm -hmm. and of course, Pentecost, which a lot of our listeners are familiar with. But when you get to these fall feasts, Brittany, it's a little bit different. What do you think happens when we start talking about Yom Teruah, also known as the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, Festival of Sukkot. What do you think a lot of our listener, listening audience might be asking questions about? I think initially, too, there's been such, like you said, misinformation about these feasts, especially when it gets to the fall feasts. And you hear these terms and they may think, oh, well, that has nothing to do with us. That's, that's Jewish feasts. That's Jewish holidays. And yet when you look in the scriptures, it, we see in Leviticus 23, it specifically states that these are the feasts of the Lord. And so we understand like, well, wait a minute, it's not just a specific nation's feasts and holy days, but this deals with the Lord. This deals with our King and our mm -hmm. Creator. And when we begin to look at these fall feasts, it's amazing to me because it actually begins to teach us and to show us through each of these, both the spring festivals that you already mentioned, how Messiah fulfilled each one of those. Well, so do these fall feasts also pertain to our Messiah, to the redemption plan, to when He comes again upon the scene. And when you begin to look at these festivals, it begins to teach you the patterns, the the signs to look for. And it really begins to fill out more of the plan that he has for his people as a whole. Would you say that, that there's a lot of prophetic symbolism in these uh, fall festivals? And in particular, if we've been alienated from the Old Testament, like quite a lot of our, our Christian listeners may have been. And so therefore, you don't have the understanding, the foundation mm -hmm. in the Hebrew roots to where you can really grasp uh, what Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot actually means. But if they are prophetic shadow pictures regarding the body of Christ or the body of Messiah, I just want to ask you a question. Do you think that these festivals are relevant to the believing community, Christians as a whole today? I believe so. In fact, when we look at this, if the spring festivals teach us about the coming of the Messiah at the beginning, when he comes as the Passover lamb and he redeems us and we read of his, um, his death, burial and resurrection. Oh my goodness. When we begin to look at these fall festivals, they actually begin to point towards his return, his second coming, when he's coming to rule as king, when he's coming to judge the earth. And when we look at these festivals, they begin to give you these mile markers, if you will, that really help fill in the gaps and teach us right. what it means when he's coming again. Why is he coming back? He's coming to rule and reign. He's coming to judge the earth. And we see these shadow pictures through these festivals that teach us of the wedding ceremony that's going to take place when he comes back for his people. And the quote unquote bride of Messiah has made herself ready in order to enter into that season as well. Well, if I were listening to you this afternoon, uh, sitting out in an audience or maybe I've turned on the television and I heard you talking about these things and being a a New Testament believer, I would have to ask you, if these are supposed to be relevant to us today, then where in the New Testament does it talk about Jesus or our Messiah Yeshua, as we would prefer calling mm -hmm. him, using his Hebrew title, where does it say that he would sanction them, or can you show me where he may have kept one or maybe multiples of these feasts? And if that's the case, then I would think as a hearer that mm -hmm. maybe I should keep these festivals. Well, we find that when we look, not only do we see that 
through the calculations and through the different scriptures where we're giving clues about when he's first born, mm -hmm. we find that these fall festivals actually happen to be the time frame when the Messiah first appears on the scene and he comes to tabernacle with among men. And so we find that not only is it signaling when he first arrives, but later in his adult life, we find that he keeps these festivals with his disciples. I believe it's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Yes. It's during the fest these fall festivals. In fact, they I believe what was it? Peter volunteers to build three sukkahs, it's three tabernacles, three tabernacles yeah. for the feast of Sukkot. But we also see what's well, really interesting to me is. Go let, ahead. Me, let me inter interrupt you there for a second because you mentioned something that's pretty in, uh, incredible in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because we've been taught over the course of years that our Messiah, that Jesus, would have been born in December mm -hmm. the twenty fifth, and yet here we are. Uh, on a Gregorian calendar, we're at the end of September, beginning in, uh, to prepare for October. And on the Hebrew calendar, there's usually a little bit difference. But what you're saying is then, if he was born during this festival called Sukkot, which actually occurs on the 15th of the 7th mm -hmm. Hebrew month, then he would not have been born in the deepest part of the winter, right? Correct, which also makes sense when you realize that the shepherds are out in the field with their flock, which they're not in the winter months, they are in this fall season. And we also can look at, there's some other verses that kind of give us a clue mm -hmm. and it actually deals with his cousin, John the Baptist, when, exactly. when he's conceived, when he is born. And so you begin to, put in these markers that kind of lay this out and you realize, wait a minute, December 25th, that doesn't work. It yeah. doesn't fit all the scriptures. It doesn't line up. But what does mm -hmm. line up is these fall festivals, which not only does the time frame line up, but the shadow pictures of these fall festivals line up because he is here to tabernacle, to dwell in a temporary dwelling, the flesh among his people. Well, honestly, when I read in the New Testament that uh, his father and his mother, Mary and Joseph, were on their way to Bethlehem, and it says there in the King James mm -hmm. English that all the world is to be taxed. And so they're going there. If I read it in King James English, it looks as if they're being required to come back and, you know, so that they can count heads for a, a, the tax mm -hmm. situation there in the Roman government. And then we find that there's no room in an inn. Maybe they're there because there's, you know, so many people are coming back for the taxation purposes, and he's placed in a manger. But what you're telling me, maybe there was something else happening. Is it possible? that there was another reason that Mary and Joseph were returning to Bethlehem at this particular time? In fact, that brings up another point that deals with the festival of the scope, because when you read in Leviticus, we find that there's actually three festivals that were pilgrimage festivals. One being Passover, one being Shavuot, and one being Sukkot, wow. when everyone was required to come back to Jerusalem to appear before Yahweh, to appear before the Lord. And so we find not only are all the people coming back, but they're, they're fulfilling this. They're coming because it's a pilgrimage festival. So you're telling me that it's possible that Jesus, or Yeshua as we, again, we call him, that he might not have been born in a stable, in a feed trough, in a stable. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. And my goodness, what a more powerful picture that we have that he comes. Come on. They're dwelling in a sukkah, which represents dwelling in that temporary dwelling place. But it also represents the Feast of Tabernacles, a divine appointment that mm -hmm. was instituted from the very beginning. And also, when you look in the sukkah, there was a place for the showbread. Wow. And it's interesting because if you go back and study what's actually happening here, the innkeeper is the one that gives them this place for them to reside. And it's a very high honor to give someone else your sukkah, your temporary dwelling to celebrate this holy convocation. So it's literally a high honor that was being paid. But there are so many other questions that are, are there uh, that should pique the interest of mm -hmm. our listeners. And it's amazing to me as we look at this particular time, and we were talking about it being a prophetic season. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask you, let's just stop. Since we're talking about three fall festivals, mm -hmm. Yom Teruah is the Hebrew word, the Hebrew phrase. Mm -hmm. And of course, it means a uh, feast of trumpets. And then we have the festival, or actually, it's not a festival. It's more of a fast day mm -hmm. called Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the last on the 15th of the month is Sukkot. Let's just focus for a second on maybe some prophetic symbolism with this Feast of Trumpets, mm -hmm. Yom Teruah. And maybe you can kind of elaborate just a little bit to show the people that may be listening, probably for the first time, what is it that's happening? And again, I believe that there are some spiritual implications mm -hmm. during these seasons, as well as natural. Well, 
maybe there's some kind of spiritual things that's going on, spiritual warfare taking place, things that we may be going through at this particular season that you might, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Know? It's amazing to me because Yom Teruah, when you begin to look, as you already alluded to, the Feast of Trumpets, it literally translates as the day of blasting. And it's not only dealing with the shofars, which we have mm -hmm. two with us here today, the ram's horn, which we see throughout scripture being referenced. And we understand the ram's horn is symbolic of the voice of the creator, mm -hmm. blasting forth and speaking forth. So not only is this a day when we find that the creator's voice, he's speaking, but also it's a day that we are to be shouting, we're to be speaking forth and blasting as well. And it's amazing because when you begin to look at that term, it actually has a warfare connotation yeah. to it. And so that goes right along with what you were alluding to. It's a spiritual warfare season that these fall festivals are dealing with. And mm. it's about us as the people also being engaged in that and preparing for this season and understanding that when we give this shout, we give this blast, it's as if it's getting the, it's catching the ear of the creator himself and he's coming amazing. to amazing. intervene and arrive on the scene in the midst of whatever battle you may be going through. Well, again, a lot of our listeners may be Christian in, in their uh, particular religious affiliation and may not be as familiar with Hebrew roots, but they probably know someone out there that's Jewish, and they may have known a little bit about some of the Jewish festivals during this time of the year. And, of course, again, these are the holy convocations that belong to uh, the Lord, but it's also at this same time that we celebrate Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, that's called Rosh Hashanah, mm -hmm. the head of the year. And so... It's interesting because our Jewish brothers believe that this would have been the season when uh, the world would have been created, mm -hmm. Adam would have been created. And so there's some interesting uh, prophetic symbolism that goes along behind the scene as we look at it. There is also uh, the, the season on the Hebrew calendar called the month of Elul, which is yes. the sixth month. And it's during the month of Elul, traditionally, that there's a purging process, a mm -hmm. sifting process that's taken place in the hearts and minds of, of men. And all of this sifting process leads us up to Yom Teruah, the day that the trumpets blast. And then Yom Teruah, tradition says that the books are open. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Can you elaborate just a little bit for our audience? Well, we find in traditions, we see that on Yom Teruah, it says that there's two books. There's the book of life, which we understand from your Christian background, the Lamb's book of life, those all who mm -hmm. have accepted Messiah, that your name, your promise is going to be written in the book of life. But we also find there's another book that's, and it's the book of death. Those that have rejected that, those that have rejected this covenant relationship, those that have rejected Messiah. And so it Yom Teru, we find the books are being opened and it's as if you're being weighed in the balance. Wow. What have you, what are your deeds for the past, this whole past season? Mm -hmm. What are the words that you've spoken, the actions that you've done? And it's this weighing in the balance. And so now we can understand, my goodness, how significant that month of a lull is because it's that month of preparation. And it's not that we wait all the way to a lull to decide, oh, I want to act right now. Right. But it's just a reminder, my goodness, we're, we're approaching this season where we're going to be examined by the Father and we don't want to be found wanting. And so we spend that time in right. prayer. We spend that time inspecting our hearts because even if we have a relationship with Him, we understand there's always areas that we can work on, areas that we can improve in, areas that we can draw closer and walk in a more intimate walk with the Father. Mm -hmm. And so we find that that's what this season is about. So not only is it this season where we understand it's the time where he's going to sit as judge over the earth, but there's also this sense of intimacy that's Amazing. building. And so for those that are willing to walk in that intimacy and take that time to do that introspection, then when he sits as judge, there's no fear in the sense of, oh my goodness, because there's this intimacy now and they can un we understand that now it's this time where we can be unified with him. Well, you mentioned two books. Actually, there's a third one. You have the Book of Life and the Book of the Dead, mm -hmm. but there's another book that's supposedly open during this particular season, and it's a book where those who are not really in either place, and they're also part of that weight in the balance, those that uh, may not have had an opportunity mm -hmm. to have had their names written in the Book of Life, but yet ha have not gone too far to the extreme. And it's interesting, this season is all so-called the season of Teshuvah, yes. which means the uh, season of return or a season mm -hmm. of reflection, the root of it being the word shu, which means to return. Return to what? Re it means to re really to return to the covenant, to return to mm -hmm. Torah, to return to the Father. And it means to leave wherever we went astray 
So whenever exactly. we went off the path and went astray to completely leave that behind, leave the sin, leave the things the, of the world behind and to turn back to him. Oh, man. And that's true, Teshiva. That's true repentance. So we don't, oh, forgive me, I'm sorry, and then go right back. It seems as if it's kind of amplified, especially for those of us that understand the prophetic symbolism and the, the inclination that a lot of us have uh, to procrastinate when it comes to dealing with personal issues. And my goodness, throughout the course of the year, there may have been some things that happened between us and some friends or whatever, and you may have had some harsh words. And uh, it is said that during this season that the books are open, the, the gates are open, the mm -hmm. heavens are open to give us an opportunity to go back and make that uh, that repentance, make mm -hmm. that teshuva between individuals. Now, it's interesting because if you study the scripture, if I have an offense between me and the creator, then I can go to him and he has to, he, he can forgive me if I uh, approach him in the proper manner. But if I have an offense against my brother, and that's mm -hmm. why we're told uh, if you bring your gift to the altar and you mm -hmm. remember that you have something against your brother, then you leave your gift mm -hmm. there and go make it right. Well, this is what this season's alluding to because Abba, the Creator is not inclined to forgive us of sin against a brother if we have not went ourselves to make that right. And so mm -hmm. this season of Teshuvah kind of gets amplified, for at least from my vantage point, during the first of the uh, month of Tishri, the seventh month, Yom Teruah, mm -hmm. and then you've got 10 days, known as the 10 days of awe, self-reflection, up until the books are supposedly closed on Yom Kippur. Wow. And it's powerful because a lot of times we can look at this, not only is he teaching us how we're interacting with him as our king, as our creator, as our God, but he's also showing us, my goodness, it's not just this relationship either, but this exactly. is affecting us as well. And so we find that when we honor these feasts and festivals, not only does it unify us with our creator, but it also unifies us as a body of believers in this because now all of a sudden we're also looking at each other and trying to make sure we've made things right between one another and it unifies the body as a whole as well. Well, to me, that's very powerful because I remember reading in Luke chapter four and it's the scene where our Messiah was had been shortly before 30 days actually, 40 days actually, had been baptized by John the Baptist, mm -hmm. Yochanan the Immerser, he goes into the wilderness for a 40-day season, which is 30 days of that month of Eloah. Mm -hmm. He comes out 10 days later on the 10th of the month, which would have been the 10th of Tishri, Yom, Yom Kippur. Kippur. And there's a scroll from Isaiah that's given to him, and he reads Isaiah 61. And when I read that, and you can read it again in Luke chapter 4, he's talking about how the Spirit of the Lord is upon mm -hmm. him. There's an anointing on him to heal the sick, heal the blind, uh, raise the dead, uh, minister to the, those mm -hmm. that have been held captive, to set at liberty those who have been bruised. And it seems to me, again, that's a one-on-one -on -one deal between me and the Creator. Of course, I understand that. But shouldn't I also have this lateral relationship with my brothers and sisters, if we're talking about unity in the body? during, Of course, during this season, it's granted. But it seems as if as we reflect on it all year long, mm -hmm. this just brings it to a, a height mm -hmm. spiritually mm -hmm. that's hard to, that's why I love these holy complications. And you can probably sense we're excited, but if this is a season when we're expecting to make teshuva, to, to return to the covenant, to do our part, to bring others in, help others to return, shouldn't we be concerned about ministering to the blind, the halt, the maimed, the sick, those that are, are depressed, wounded, or for whatever reason? Exactly. In fact, that's what we see Messiah does. He reads that and what does he do? He goes out and he begins to do those very things. My goodness, what better time than to go out and to minister to people, to see these things happen, to see the miraculous begin to move. If this is a divine appointment and this is what this season is about, my goodness, if we're willing vessels like he was, how much more so will he then move among his people again? And so it's really exciting because especially for those that maybe they don't know, they don't understand this sure. season, they don't understand, they're part of those that are held captive, they're part of those that their eyes are still blind, their ears are deaf to this. What better time than to go during this season and begin to share this, the good news of what the Messiah is doing, of what the Father is doing in this season, and there's a chance for them also to come back, a chance for them to be set free, to be healed, to be made whole That's again. That's powerful. And I know that a lot of you are listening out there. You've probably heard a little bit about these holy convocations, these feasts and these festivals. And 
you probably are more familiar with Yom Kippur, and there's a sense of awe and even mm -hmm. a sense of dread uh, for that particular day of the year. And it's simply because it was when the high priest would go in once a year to offer a, a sacrifice mm -hmm. for, for the nation. And it's a day of fasting and, and afflicting the flesh mm -hmm. and the self. But it's interesting to me that uh, at that same time, as the books are examined, our lives are examined spiritually, and that book is closed, and those that have the proper relationship are allowed to go into the wedding feast, which wow. is symbolized in the festival of Sukkot. Most people probably aren't aware of the fact, Brittany, that Yom Kippur is also the day of the wedding mikvah. Can you explain a little bit about that as we're in preparation for the last of the fall festivals, Sukkot? Yes. The mikvah, it's, it's a beautiful symbolic thing that they would go and they would immerse themselves completely in the water. And you would think, oh, well, you know, it's, it's this time of cleansing, but it's not just about a physical cleansing. It's mm -hmm. not a, a bath. It's not taking a bath, but it's literally, it deals with something spiritual that's symbolic. taking place, that's symbolic. And that when the person, the individual goes below the water, it's symbolic of death. They're completely dying to their old self. And when they come up and raise up, Amazing. They're, they're a new creation. They're a new creature, which is exactly what the scriptures teach us that Messiah is offering us. You too can be made a new creation, a new something that's never been mm -hmm. seen before before and that's what the mikvah is and that's what he offers us at Yom Kippur the chance for this wedding mikvah so that his people can be as if they've never sinned they can be completely made new raised made alive again wow. in order to enter into the wedding ceremony how beautiful uh, that wedding mikvah for the for the potential groom and his and his potential bride uh, the sages teach that once they have this ritual cleansing process and it's not that they go in together they go in separate mm -hmm. because the you want to be righteous and chaste and holy in preparation of the wedding ceremony and what takes place afterwards but it's interesting as they go in the sages teach that when they come out they're just like the condition that adam and eve would have been found in the garden of eden wow. never having sinned before perfect in their relationship with the creator perfect before each other and so what a powerful prophetic picture that we can see in these holy convocations these holy feasts and I know we, we're running out of time, but this all leads up to the season known as the, the Festival of Joy, the season of our joy, the Feast of Sukkot. And we're, we're getting ready. Our whole congregation yes. is now getting prepared. Uh, and we have people coming from all over the world that are going to be here in the Pacific Northwest celebrating Sukkot with us, Feast of Tabernacles. Share just a little bit about what it means to you as, a, a, as an individual in preparation for what you believe is coming. Well, the Festival of Sukkot, as you said, it's the festival of our joy. It's the season of our joy. And it's a week-long celebration that Yahweh has placed on His calendar for His people. Not only does it remind us that where we live now is temporary, that there's bigger, greater things that He has for us, but it also is a reminder that they came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's what He tells them when He instructs them to celebrate Sukkot. This is your reminder that I brought you out of Egypt. You dwelt in the wilderness in a temporary dwelling. My goodness, it's a reminder for us today. He brought us out of bondage. He set us free and he has better plans for us. He has promises that he has for us. And not only that, but we find that the word sukkah itself, it's this place of protection. And so for a week long, he brings you to the, this place of protection, this sanctuary, this place that's set apart specifically for him to come and dwell among his people. So there's this sense of this is a divine appointment and you're coming. And for an entire week, you get to join with other people and together the goal is to worship and to honor the king and you're completely separated from the world and everything else that is going on in the Amazing. world, which is such a gift that we don't always get that opportunity to do, to dedicate that type of time and effort and focus on just worshiping and honoring him. And in the sukkah, we would have a place prepared for a loaf of bread and we would call that bread the challah bread and it's a lifted up loaf. And of course it represents the manna from heaven the bread of heaven, which we know our Messiah is the living bread. And how apropos, Brittany, that our Messiah is born during this time, wow. not in a stable. He was born in a sukkah. Maybe it would have been attached to the side of that inn where the innkeeper mm -hmm. uh, had his business. And he is born and placed the living bread, the manna from heaven, the bread of life is placed in this specific container the challah bread would have been prepared wow. by his mother and father for, for generations. 
And to me, I think about this season that we're celebrating now as we're getting ready as a congregation, anticipating having access to that bread of life. That's amazing it's to me. It's powerful. And it's it's amazing to me because he was given a place of honor then. And a lot of times we, we miss that. We don't understand that when we say, oh, he was in, he was just out in the manger. No, it was a place of honor. And when it comes to Sukkot, once again, we have a chance, just as that innkeeper did, to put him in a place of honor and to give him the honor that's due come this festival. Wow. I hope that you've enjoyed this evening as we've been talking a little bit about these holy convocations, the, the fall festivals, and in particular that you can sense that there's something far more powerful uh, behind it spiritually than just what you can glean reading a few verses in the scripture. And we prayerfully, we piqued your interest enough that you will want to search out this bread of life, this bread of heaven, and you'll want more of the, an intimate relationship with him. And we challenge you to go back and read what's said there in Leviticus mm -hmm. chapter 23 regarding these holy convocations. And Brittany, why don't you get ready to close us out and just bless the people as we get ready to go. We also just want to remind you, we, we actually produced a free ebook. You can go to our website, livingmana.net, and it's a free resource for you to look, and it goes through all three of these fall festivals, and we hope that it's a blessing to you during this season. Shalom. Shalom Aleichem.